Modern. Absolutely new, a real break with everything. And that's the story of Paris, the luminous years. There's something magnificent about it. Next. If I had not gone to Paris, I would not be who I am. There is no greater revolution of the eye than the one I found when I arrived. The sun of art shone only in Paris. We all went to Paris. It was our goal. If you succeeded in Paris, all doors were open to you. We always returned to it, no matter who we were. Paris was always worth it. And you receive return for whatever you brought to it. If I was going to starve, I might as well starve where the food was good and the people agreeable. Paris was where the 20th century was. It was where we had to be. For an incandescent moment, from 1905 to 1930, Paris was a mecca, the magnetic center of a new world of the arts, a laboratory of experiment and innovation. It attracted an international avant-garde destined to be part of the making of the modern. Overnight, it seemed, in all the great art centers of the West, the art of the past, even the recent past became obsolete. Why did Paris become the chosen destination for so many, who in 25 short years revolutionized the arts? Why Paris? The rebels of the 20th century's first decade were drawn to Montmartre. The year is 1905. Montmartre is still rural. Goats and vineyards share the steep hillsides with the painters Pablo Picasso, André Durand, Georges Braque. Their studios were often within minutes of each other. Montmartre looked not like what the rest of the Rive Droite. It looked like something on the edges of Paris. It's up there on the mountains. I mean, it's, you know, it's high. You have to climb up stairs to get there. It's little squares, it's little streets. Cut off from the rest of Paris. French and foreign artists of all genres streamed into Montmartre in record numbers. For the first time, the Paris avant-garde became truly international. Nearly half were foreign. They were lured by its legendary reputation as the preferred neighborhood of famous predecessors. Auguste Renoir, Eugène Delacroix, Vincent van Gogh, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Its promise of a free bohemian lifestyle and chiefly for comrades in art. In Montmartre was a, a sense of community, a sense of being together, a sense of being alike. 
doing the same type of work. He was a painter, I was a writer, and we were together. The guy who came to visit you in your studio when you were, when you were Picasso was Marc Jacob or Guillaume Apollinaire. And they knew, they could understand what you were trying to do. Montmartre was less than a few square miles. Artists crossed paths constantly, exchanging news and trading gossip. Their favorite playgrounds were just down the hill. The Le Pain Gilles, the local hangout for the Picasso gang. The Moulin Rouge, still enjoyed for its attractions and its romantic encounters. The Madrano Circus, where they liked to mingle with the clowns. By the time Picasso came to Montmartre in what was, I think, his third trip to Paris, when he decided to stay in 1904, he went somewhere where, you know, he was already, he knew that there would be something that might look like an artistic community. Van Gogh had already gone to Montmartre. Gauguin apparently was visiting at the Bateau Lavoie when he came back from the South Seas in the mid 90s. So there was already something. A dilapidated building on the Rue Ravignon was the first real home and studio in Paris for the young Picasso during six crucial years, 1904 to 1910. Painters Juan Gris, Kees van Dongen, and poets Max Jacob and André Salmon were among those long on talent but short of cash who appreciated its cheap rents and its camaraderie. It was freezing in the winter and like a hot house in the summer. I mean, there was no gas, there was no electricity. Uh, this was very uh, rough and very, I mean, but Picasso apparently remembers that these were, he said later on, his best years. And he says the years when he really was an artist, when he felt like an artist, and he said, and not like a bête curieuse, as he said, not like this, uh, you know, animal of curiosity. Picasso's companion, muse, and model was Fernand d'Olivier, who had posed for other painters in Montmartre until she fell in love with the jealous Spaniard. For six years, Fernand lived at the Bateau Lavoie with Picasso, where Picasso's home was always open to his friends. I lived with them, nearer to them than anyone else. Whenever the friends met, it was always the same greeting. Et le travail, ça marche? How is the work going? Puh, was the usual response of Picasso, always worried. The stubborn searcher for whom the work never went very well. The artists lived for their work and for hope. In 1905, La Bonne de Picasso, the Picasso gang, was formed. The poets Guillaume Apollinaire and André Salmon would become charter members. Picasso's close and lifelong friends. When Picasso met the two poets, he immediately introduced them to his closest friend, poet Max Jacob. With one major exception, Georges Braque, Picasso's most intimate friends were all poets. Guillaume Apollinaire remembers the Picasso gang. From then on, painter and poets are seldom apart. They have their private dialect, their own clothing code, their favorite hangouts. They eat together. They tramp singing in the streets. And they return very late to the Bateau Lavoir, where Picasso had marked on his door with the blue chalk, Au rendezvous des poètes. And every evening they challenge each other, and they reinvent art between great bursts of laughter there was always a connection, a fraternity, between uh, writers, poets especially, and painters. Painters don't write, they don't explain themselves, so they need somebody to do that for them. And if 
you are Picasso and you have the voice of Apollinaire, well, it's not bad. Guillaume Apollinaire played a dual role in the theater that was Paris in the luminous years. Poet laureate and impresario to the avant-garde, he went everywhere and knew everyone. As an influential writer and critic, Apollinaire used his multiple talents, including his poetry, to defend whatever was new and exciting in the arts. I judge hard this long quarrel of tradition and invention, of order and adventure. We who seek adventure everywhere, we are not your enemies. We want to give you vast and strange domains where the flowers of mystery offer themselves to all who wish to pluck them. There are new fires and colors never seen before, a thousand inconceivable fantasies to which reality must be given. We want to explore kindness, that vast country where all is silence. He was a great, great poet. His perhaps most revolutionary poem was called Zone, and it begins, you are weary of that old world, tu es là de ce monde ancien. And he talked about the trolleys, he talked about the buses, the bridges were shepherds minding the buses as they circulated in the streets of Paris. Uh, this was a revolutionary poem because uh, poetry had turned its back on the real world. This poem was like a trumpet call to the avant-garde, to Fernand Leger's industrial paintings, to composers' use of typewriters and airplane propellers in their music, to modernism. Apollinaire really presents a large canvas of what art was about to become. For the poet Philippe Soupeau, it was Guillaume Apollinaire who spoke to his generation. He était étonné de voir que les jeunes venaient le voir et aussi euh, écouter ses conseils. Il se demandait toujours si on ne lui faisait pas une farce. Il y avait une méfiance chez Apollinaire, une méfiance assez naturelle, puisque au fond, Apollinaire était lui-même un mystificateur. I was always a little afraid of the big and, I would add the fat, Apollinaire. You know, I did not much like showing my canvases. However, Apollinaire had promised me to write the preface of my 1914 Berlin Exposition. He came, then looked for a long time at my paintings with his big eyes. After, we went to have lunch at a small restaurant in Montparnasse. While eating a lot, and at a speed that impressed me, Apollinaire repeated between two mouthfuls, it's tremendous what you are doing. I was very flattered. Marc Chagall was living at La Rouche, the Beehive, a group of 70 or so communal studios in a large garden near the slaughterhouses in Montparnasse. La Rouche was appreciated in their early years by Fernand Leger, Amadeo Modigliani, Diego Rivera, and by numerous painters and sculptors from the Russian Empire. Jacques Lipschitz, Alexander Achipenko, Osip Zadkin, and Chagall. In those studios lived the artistic bohemia of every land. While in the Russian ateliers, an offended model sobbed. From the Italians came the sound of songs and the twanging of a guitar, and from the Jews, debates and arguments. I sat alone in my studio before my kerosene lamp, a studio jammed with pictures, with canvases, which moreover were not really canvases, but my table napkins, my bedsheets, my nightshirts, torn into pieces. Dawn is breaking. Down below, a little way off, they are slaughtering cattle. The cows low, and I paint them. It's 1909, 1910. La Ruche becomes the place somehow that things move. By the time these artists came, and they came from Eastern Europe, from shtetls, from little villages, 
So poverty was not a novelty for them. Some of them had already studied in art academies and they came to Paris nevertheless because that was the place to go to. I mean, this uh, was the, the, you know, as I said, the city of lights. It was the place where they wanted to go. In La Ruche, there was a real community there. They could paint there. There were courses there with the model. Uh, they, they did everything there. They painted there, they slept there, they ate there. They didn't speak French. Apparently, they spoke Yiddish and Russian and Polish. And then they enrolled in academies in Montparnasse. The function of the established art schools in Paris was to prepare their students for acceptance in the great annual Parisian Salon. The Salon demanded strictly academic artworks, and the teachers saw to it that their students conformed to the hallowed traditions of the past. Donc, six mois de Paris. Six mois de Paris à l'école. Six mois perdus pour rien. Des vexations. Un tas de choses inutiles. Entourés par des gens qui font de la carrière. Et vous, petit bonhomme, rejeté un peu en arrière, regardez avec mépris par tous ceux qui préparent les prix, les prix de robe. It's interesting because, in a way, they were a community, but they did not identify with an ism. I mean, you know, we have Cubism, we have Fauvism. Interestingly, the painters who came out from La Ruche, they had no manifesto. And it is because I don't think they have a unified style. The ambiance La Ruche, combined with full exposure to the creative ferment in Paris, had a striking effect on their work. Each artist absorbed and translated the new movements differently into a highly individual style. The friendship between Russian painter Marc Chagall and Swiss poet Blaise Sondrar is another example of the creative interaction between poets and painters in modernist Paris. Si vous voulez, c'est Sandra, elle est la première à venir dans mon atelier, tout seul. Il a surtout été avec lui aussi parce qu'il parlait russe. Et moi, vraiment, je ne savais pas encore bien parler. Pour pouvoir acheter du pain ou des choses, ça c'était une grande difficulté pour moi à apprendre. Demander le tableau, voir, parce que je ne montrais pas. Alors je montais le tableau. Quand il avait un poème neuf, il venait, il venait souvent à l'atelier le, le lire. Blaise Sandra wrote a portrait of Marc Chagall. He's asleep. He's awake. Suddenly, he paints. He takes a church and paints with the church. He takes a cow and paints with the cow. With a sardine. With heads, hands, knives. He paints with a bull's pitzel. He paints with all the foul passions of a little Jewish town, with all the exacerbated sexuality of the Russian provinces. For France. Enthusiasm for pictures scarcely conceived. Heads, disjointed limbs, flying cows. I remember all that. And you, Sandra? place that has layers of, of history, many connected with cafes. It's impossible to exaggerate how important the cafe was in the life of, of the artists here in Paris. 
They lived in hotel rooms, maybe tiny apartments, unheated, cold. For a cup of coffee, they could sit at a cafe. And they had heat, a toilet, all the necessities for writing or for sketching. And cafe society really isn't about some high cultured mentality. It's about people who don't actually live at home. They live among and with other people in cafes, talking about art, talking about culture, talking about politics. People gathered in cafes because while France was a democracy and speech relatively freer than in many other European countries, in France in the 19th century there were laws against group meetings and permits were needed with lengthy delays or frequent denials. Groups gathered in cafes as a way of circumventing these restrictions. It became a tradition. They would plan new exhibitions of their paintings. They would plan literary magazines. They would find publishers for their fiction. And of course, the, the, the publishers of the little magazines would find writers that they could publish in, in their magazines. There was a ferment of ideas and influences that really made for a revolution in painting and literature. The center of the art scene in Paris started to shift in 1910 from Montmartre to Montparnasse, from the right bank of the Seine to the left bank. Et là, nous étions. Euh, il faut, ne faut pas oublier aussi que Montparnasse était un village, une petite ville de province. L'herbe poussait entre les pavés. Tout cela se passait entre nous. C'était des disputes très violentes, quelquefois, des brouilles, des haines, des amours. Mais tout ça était entre nous. The store of fair Vavin in Montparnasse had four cafés. It was extremely strategic. Café de the Dome, the Rotonde, uh, the Coupole, the Select. I mean, it had those four uh, cafes on its four, like almost like, you know, truly about a military placing of avant garde. Those cafes become the place where artists meet. They're sitting in the cafes, they're drawing in the cafes on this wide sidewalk. And that is unique to Paris. Paris était une ville libre, une ville ouverte, que d'ailleurs nous avons prise puisque toute la révolution de l'art s'est produite à cette époque. Paris was glorious past and vibrant present. But for the seekers from many nations, Paris was the future. And yet the astonishing sensations of early 20th century Paris with the retrospectives of three 19th century painters. Between 1903 and 1907, a lot of things happened. There were three exhibitions of the three luminaries for fauvism uh, of the late 19th century, which are Gauguin, Cézanne, and Van Gogh. Gauguin and his retrospective in 1903 was very, very important. He had lived the, the last years of his life very far away and died very, very far away. And so that retrospective made those works, many of which had never been seen, I presume, even more extraordinary. And artists studied that. is a style that is made of those three or four different styles of post-impressionism. Fauvism is the late 19th century at a higher temperature. 
1905, which is often seen, at least in the annals of art history, as the beginning of the 20th century, when the critic, middle of the road, again, semi-conservative, and in that sense, typical French, uh, comes to um, the Salon d'Automne and sees uh, in one room uh, those you know, brightly covered canvases by Matisse, Durin, and Lamanc. And he's horrified and he calls them the fauve, right? The wild beasts. This moment, which is a baptism by fire, is often seen as the beginning, at least in art history, of the 20th century. Of all the pictures shown at the 1905 exhibition, Henri Matisse's painting, Woman with Hat, was the notorious magnet of attention and abuse. Gertrude Stein, expatriate author, was an early collector of modern art. In the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, she writes of the episode, in Alice's voice, as a turning point in Matisse's career. It was the time of Matisse's mental struggle concerning his work. He had lost all possibility of showing his pictures at the official salon. Then came the first autumn salon of the independence. He was asked to exhibit, and he sent La Femme au Chapeau, Woman with Hat, and it was hung. It was very strange in its color and in its anatomy. It infuriated the public. They tried to scratch off the paint. Gertrude Stein could not understand why. The picture seemed to her perfectly natural. She said she wanted to buy it. It was derided and attacked, and it was sold. It was at the 1905 Salon d'Automne that Georges Braque discovered the vibrant colors of fauvism and was soon converted. He became close friends with these artists. Matisse and Durin showed me the way. The next year, 1906, Braque enthusiastically adopted the style and palette of fauvism. When Braque started to see his friends, the fauve, Matisse, Marquet, and Mar Durin and the likes, who were painting with crude colors, violent colors. And he started to do the same, and in a very brilliant way. At the Spring Salon, Brock showed six of his new Fauvis paintings with remarkable success. All six were sold. And then he saw Cezanne. He studied Cezanne with great attention and he changed. Cezanne is the single most important artist for the development of early 20th century art in Paris and arguably the single most important artist for the development of modern art in the early 20th century anywhere. His retrospective is held in 1907, and one starts to see the Cezanne influence in various ways from that moment on. Now, when we say the Cezanne influence, I should be clear that there are as many Cezannes as there are artists to interpret him. For Matisse, Cezanne is about a sense of a kind of solidity and about color. For Picasso, it's about the breaking up of solidity, and yet both of them cite Cezanne as their master. Cezanne's uh, influence by 1910 is simply so great that to ally yourself with Cezanne is to declare yourself a modern artist. And Cezanne in 1907 is key to uh, the beginning of Cubism. I mean, there's no beginning of Cubism without this retrospective. So we have, of course, this kind of non-synchronicity. Things always happen together. That is, 1907, Cezanne, that exhibition can be seen as the end of the 19th century 
and the beginning of the 20th at the same time. Things of the end and the beginning together. 1907 was the year that the challenge of Paris, Astonish Me, was met head on by two painters. 1907 is the year Matisse shows his blue nude. Picasso paints Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. That same year, two momentous events change Picasso's destiny. One will give him a partner in a great adventure. The other will provide the painter with his strongest supporter and lifelong friend. Picasso meets the art dealer, Daniel H. Kahnweiler. D. H. Kahnweiler is the missionary who first championed the Cubists, a key figure in the development of modern art. Kahnweiler lived to be 95. He was the last surviving witness to the period. Un beau jour, je vis entrer un jeune homme dont l'aspect me frappait beaucoup. Il était très mal habillé, pantalon de velours, veston, au coude déchiré avec des souliers boueux. Il était poussiéreux, mais il avait des yeux admirables qui me frappaient immédiatement, les cheveux d'un noir de corbeau, une très belle tête. Il était petit. Ce jeune homme, sans rien dire, fit le tour de la galerie, regardait tout ce qui était accroché au mur et s'en fut. Soon afterward, Kahnweiler went to the Bateau Lavoie to visit the studio of this badly dressed young man. Dans cette étrange pièce, dans cette pauvre pièce dans laquelle j'entrais, il y avait un, une, un très gros chien, une très belle femme. Il y avait des toiles roulées ou sur châssis qui traînaient partout. Et il y avait ce grand tableau qui a été le point de départ du cubisme des demoiselles d'Avignon. Even Picasso's friends were not prepared for this. One said, what would you say if your mother met you at the train in Barcelona with a face like that? A devoted collector nearly wept. He said, what a loss for French art. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon would not be shown outside of Picasso's studio for four long years. The walls of his studio were hung with African masks and African musical instruments. There was severe competition in those days between Picasso, Durin, Matisse, and Brock as to who could discover the most beautiful African heads. Negro masks open new horizons to me. They put me in touch with things instinctive. But African sculpture had not prepared Georges Braque for the shock that awaited him at the Bateau Lavoie in 1907. Kahnweiler had introduced him to Apollinaire. Apollinaire lost no time in taking Braque to meet Picasso. That day, in Picasso's studio, Braque saw Les Demoiselles d'Avignon for the first time. It's as though you want to make us eat rope and drink gasoline. Someday they'll find Picasso hanged behind that picture. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon was not exactly cubist, but it was kind of barbaric construction that was not full, that was not yet cubist. It was something very strange. Uh, good or bad, nobody knows. It was new, absolutely new, a real break with everything. And he was upset. You can understand that because he was of a, of a good French education, you know, and he saw that. That came from... <laughs> Nobody knows where. <laughs> and he started to study, to think. And pretty soon he painted his own great nude, which is again something new. 
and for sure in the French culture. The only thing that could compare with it was the Demoiselle d'Avignon. In summer 1908, Braque returned to paint in Cezanne country. His work took on a whole new dimension. In the fall of 1908, he decided to submit six of his new Cezanne-inspired paintings to the Salon d'Automne. Although his Fauvist friends were on the jury, all six canvases were rejected. They rejected this young Fauve guy that they, they had hoped so much he would become one of them and one of the most brilliant. And this young guy decided to be something very strange that, he, that they couldn't imagine what. It was Daniel H. Kahnweiler who would invite Brock to exhibit these pictures at his gallery. Cubist pictures were shown for the first time on November 9th, 1908. This exhibition was reviewed by art critic Louis Vossel. As he had done with Impressionism and with Fauvism, Vossel would once again invent a label for an exhibition that would christen a movement. Monsieur Braque is indeed a daring young man. Perhaps he is also too much obsessed by the style of Cezanne. He despises form, reduces everything, landscapes, figures, and houses, to little cubes. The only person who might understand what he was doing was Picasso. Brock and Picasso started to drop in at each other's studios. They were both intensely interested in what the other was doing. And then the two painters went their own way and they painted a mixture of Cezanne and something else. This something else is interesting. And when they came back, they met, and they realized that they had painted them in the same way. The same way that Matisse and others didn't like. And pretty soon, they were working together, exchanging ideas, correcting each other, helping each other, pushing each other forward. We were living in Montmartre. We saw each other every day and talked a lot. Things were said between us in those years that cannot be said again, that no one would understand now. We were like two mountain climbers roped together. Brock and Picasso used to spend the mornings together in a little cheap uh, room, a studio that they rented, and there they talked and talked and talked and talked. They talked there for, uh, I should think it must have been two or three months, and they just spent gabbling, gabbling, saying, yes, 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 but no, now listen to me. And then back and forth it went. And they hammered out between them the beginnings of Cubism. So at, at one moment, let's say 1910, 1911, you just wonder at times, which one is Brock? Which one is Picasso? You don't know. Cubism was, of course, a very occult, new way of regarding what you could not see. I think Gertrude Stein was very helpful when she said, the point of Cubism is that you paint, and I had this from Picasso, she said. She didn't at all. She helped make it up herself. When she said, after all, you paint what you know is there, not what you can see. En ce faisant, ils sont parvenus, me semble-t-il, à découvrir que la peinture était en fait une écriture, que tout ce qui s'inscrivait sur le tableau était des signes qui signifiaient le monde extérieur et non point un reflet pur et simple de ce monde extérieur. But the audience is free to refuse to learn how to read Cubist. Mm -hmm. 
Gertrude Stein never had the slightest difficulty in reading Cubism. The writer became one of the earliest collectors of Picasso's Cubist works. Well, Gertrude Stein, of course, was the most phenomenal woman living in Paris at that time, was phenomenal from the viewpoint of a personality, of a writer, of a woman who developed her own particular fame, her own particular style of writing, and whose writing became a memento to herself and to her period in Paris. Yet, it was only in the 1930s with the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas that Gertrude Stein, the writer, got the public attention she always felt she deserved. Until then, she was known mainly in America as a pioneer collector of modern art and for her famous Saturday evening salon. I had been invited to the Rue de Fleurus on Saturday evening, which is when everybody came. Indeed, everybody did come. I murmured to Picasso that I liked his portrait of Gertrude Stein. Yes, he said. Everybody says that she does not look like it. But that does not make any difference. She will. Gertrude Stein thought of her writing as a literary form of Cubism. Cubism is something very large. Probably the most important revolution in thinking of the 20th century. It, because it affects not only um, painting, but also all kinds of things. While Cubism was revolutionizing painting and sculpture, a new theatrical explosion was lighting up Paris. It was set off by a flamboyant Russian genius, Serge Diaghilev, whose ballet Russe reinvented the ballet. With Igor Stravinsky's scores, starting with The Firebird, Paris became the vibrant new center of modern music. Diaghilev, I think, was the single most important man in the art world of his time. And it wasn't simply because he was the head of the Ballet Russe, but rather because the Ballet Russe was also a, a meeting ground, a crossroads for artists from all kinds of different fields, for dancers, for choreographers, for painters, for scene designers, for composers and musicians. So all of those contemporary artists, modern artists, met in the Ballet Russe. And of course, Serge Diaghilev transformed ballet itself, which was an existing form, but he transformed it into a form that was vital and contemporary. The Ballet Russe never performed in Russia. In the spring of 1909, Diaghilev brought to Paris many of the finest dancers from the Russian Imperial Ballet in sumptuous new productions. The Ballet Russe, in fact, only came into existence really in Paris because it was Paris which greeted the new works such as Firebird and Petrushka and applauded them to such a degree that Diaghilev then decided to form a permanent company, and that permanent company would have its headquarters um, in the West, and its energy would come out of Paris. Paris, with its sophisticated audience and wealthy patrons, gave Diaghilev the freedom and support he needed. The astute Russian gave Paris the new sensations it loved. Diaghilev's first love was music, and he studied to become a composer. He showed some of his music to Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, the famous Russian composer. But Rimsky 
apparently told him that his music was absurd, at which point Diaghilev stormed out and, of course, was profoundly wounded and never wrote any music again. However, imagine what kind of training that was for an impresario who was going to be commissioning music from Stravinsky and Prokofiev and numerous other composers, someone who could look down and say, you know, this really needs a slightly different kind of orchestration. The Ballet Russe enabled Diaghilev to realize some of his deepest aspirations. The elevation of the male dancer to a dominant position in the ballet. And the creation of great roles for his protege and lover, Václav Nijinsky. Often people say, did he really jump so high? And I always say, I don't know how far from the ground, but I know it was near the stars. And indeed, in everything, he extracted the essence. In Sylphide, he was the very soul of Chopin. In Petrushka, he was like the pain of every man weighted down by fate. And when he did fawn, he was a completely dehumanized creature, half animal, but not so much animal as nature in general. It was really under Diaghilev's tutelage that he began to reveal a creative self. Diaghilev was always a mentor. <laughs> Somehow mentor and uh, developing talent uh, was something in Diaghilev's bones. And so very soon he began to develop him as a choreographer. And the first results of this mentorship was the afternoon of a fawn. For Nijinsky's first choreography, Diaghilev decided on an early modernist poem by Stéphane Mallarmé that had moved French composer Claude Debussy to compose The Afternoon of a Fawn. It was about the fawn going through various states of mind, from uh, awakening back to a dream, back to languorous contemplation about the nymphs. decided to avoid melody. He said traditional melody is anti-lyrical because it doesn't capture mobility, the mobility of souls, the mobility of life. So what he does is use um, a little motive that evolves melodically, that is always changing, that is always moving in unexpected directions to follow the rise and falls of the consciousness of the fawn. Nijinsky's choreography was shocking. There are no lifts. All the major aspects of ballet technique are just taken away. Here's the great god of the dance, creating a work in which there was one jump, only one. And it was very sexualized. At the end, he picks up her scarf, takes it back to his rock, and begins to make love to it. Diaghilev always thought in terms of the creative artist and 
went through the direst difficulties financially, always keeping being kept afloat by uh, his friendships and occasional alliances with uh, the Otto Kahn's and the Aga Kahn's and uh, Sunnail, and feels that he used all this society world for his aims. There's something magnificent about it. Diaghilev never permitted his troubles to affect his searching out the most brilliant painters and composers for the next season. His famous demand, Astonish Me, challenged modern artists who, for the first time, compose music or design sets and costumes for the ballet. For 20 years, the success of these Ballet Russe collaborations electrified Paris and resonated throughout the avant-garde, stimulating bold fusions in the arts. The painters would be led by Picasso, who would become part of the Ballet Russe's extended family, not only by designing five new ballets, but through marriage to a beautiful Russian dancer. The success of Igor Stravinsky's scores for the ballets Firebird and Petrushka was a major breakthrough for modernist composers in Paris. Ballets would be choreographed to new scores by Serge Prokofiev, Manuel de Falla, Eric Satie, Maurice Ravel, Debussy. Suddenly there comes this work which seems to be nothing but naked rhythm. The Rite of Spring was perhaps the most radical of Stravinsky's Russian ballets. It's partly the uh, scenario of this primitive rite in which a maiden dances herself to death that pushes him to the extreme here. Experimenting with the basic primitive force of rhythm, of rhythmic repetition, the power of rhythm to create tension, then he'll follow it by another block. So he's constructing music in a fundamentally new way. When Stravinsky arrived in Paris under the sponsorship of Diaghilev, he was not the most avant-garde Russian musician at all. He pushed himself to his extreme as a modernist composer under the impact of the kind of modernist culture that he experienced, that he found in Paris. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. Uh, closet that I had my books and so on, you know, and I put on the door. It is here in French. It is here that I I am composing mm -hmm. the Sacre du Printemps. And I said Igor Stravinsky. When I finished composing the Rite of Spring, I played it for Dagilev. He listened a little while. And then he says, Will it last a very long time this way? And I said, To the end, my dear. Nijinsky developed a choreography that was just as bold and just as daring as was Stravinsky's music. Stravinsky arrived. And he sat down to the piano. I think he watched the rehearsal first. He was appalled. He said, this is not at all the tempo. This has got to be quicker. This has got to be slower. Nizinski said, this can't be quicker and this can't be slower. I know what the dancers can do. There was an epic battle between them. Stravinsky sat at the piano and trying to make an orchestra, he stamped with his feet and banged with his hands on the piano here and there and shouted and sang and so on. And, you know, I can't remember who won. <laughs> the Rite of Spring musically shocked the audience. And then combined with Nijinsky's choreography, this was nothing pleasant. 
this was something that was really in many ways an affront to uh, the sensibility of the audience. When started with the sacrifice of the men, she had to stand, her feet turned in, her hands under her chin, and trembling like that. So somebody in the audience from the gallery shouted, uh, un docteur! And somebody else shouted, un dentiste! And somebody else shouted, deux dentistes! <laughs> and of course, lots of people laughed, others shrieked. The pandemonium was absolutely. It was no surprise that in the atmosphere of Paris in 1913, that this would be an explosive event. War was brewing. It was not the time for an assault on French traditionalism, but this is precisely what happened. And it was because of this that you have uh, the famous riot within the theater. And this, again, the cries of, of, of being traitor, of being modernist, of being Bosch. <laughs> In 1913, the company sailed off for a tour of South America. Diaghilev stayed in Europe. And at that point, a young woman who had had her eye on Nijinsky basically persuaded Nijinsky to marry her. Diaghilev concealed the violent storm of emotions that shook him on learning of Nijinsky's marriage. His icy dismissal of Nijinsky from the Ballet Russe stunned the naive young dancer. The urgent necessity to replace Nijinsky as choreographer and lead dancer in a new ballet not only distracted Diaghilev from the pain of Nijinsky's desertion, but was instrumental in the discovery of a successor. Leonid Massin would step into Nijinsky's place in the Ballet Russe and in Diaghilev's life. The summer of 1914 found Brock and Picasso painting together once again in the countryside near Avignon. They were working on a new phase of Cubism. This would be the last summer of their collaboration and the end of their friendship. We had been vacationing close to each other near Avignon when the mobilization started. Brock and Durant were called up. I said goodbye to Brock and Durant at the train station. And I never really found them again. of World War I on the Paris avant-garde was enormous. Among the mobilized French artists were Fernand Leger, Georges Braque, André Durand, André Breton. Many foreign artists volunteered. Guillaume Apollinaire, Blaise Sendra, Osip Zadkine. Their wartime experience alienated the artists who fought in the war from those foreign artists who did not enlist. Brock and Picasso did not speak for years. First World War may seem as if it's a far cry from anything that might directly affect something as insular as the avant-garde. It turns out the avant-garde is not minor or insular. It's very much part of the fabric of French society, and when French society must deal with the war, it turns out the avant-garde must deal with it as well. Foreigners were suspect. 
of course, especially foreigners who were German. The most important dealer of the Cubists, Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, was a German. His paintings are confiscated by the French government. Juan Gris, who had been a draft dodger in Spain, was terribly frightened that he might be arrested and returned uh, to Spain. His dealer was Kahnweiler. He writes very nervous letters to Kahnweiler. Dear friend, you who are absent cannot imagine how every foreigner is suspect, no matter what his nationality. They say appalling things and make terrible accusation against myself and anyone who had dealings with you. Philippe Soupeau once told me, you cannot understand because you do not know the kind of propaganda there was at the time. It was, an in it was incredible. Very few could resist that propaganda. So that all of a sudden, those Germans were enemies and you had to kill them. The war was an opportunity for the right uh, and traditional anti-modernist conservative uh, parts of the Parisian art world to dig in against foreigners and what they saw as the uh, unpatriotic and uh, deleterious effects of the avant-garde in Paris. And they accuse Cubism of being a German phenomenon. Of course, it is clear that whatever you don't understand is enemy. At the time, the enemy was German. Therefore, Cubism was German art. Artists start to become worried about the look of their art. And an entire kind of anti-Cubist or un-Cubist phenomenon is put in place, and Picasso is the leader of that, which is a new classicism. The great example of that is Picasso's portraits. Imitations of Ang. There sweeps through Paris a kind of Ang revival including Juan Gris and all the artists who had been Cubists. Soon the galleries were filled with the patriotic response of painters, some of whose recent Cubist canvases were hardly dry. Picasso is subject to accusation of cowardice. He was a healthy young man. And he is handed a few, or so we're told, white feathers, uh, signs of cowardice at the time. 1915 was truly the winter of Picasso's discontent. His closest friends, Apollinaire and Brock, were in the army. His art dealer, Kahnweiler, was exiled. His Cubist art and his loyalty to France as a non-combatant foreigner were under attack. When Jean Cocteau decided that he needed to make Picasso his friend, the timing was right. Picasso was ready. Picasso at once considered me a friend. He introduced me to the painters and poets. Cocteau decides that he's going to move toward the avant-garde by bringing Picasso into the fold of the Ballet Russe. That marriage really means that the avant-garde can become a powerful force, not just a force among artists, but a force in culture in general. Nous avons fait parade ensemble à Rome, et je lui ai demandé de collaborer avec moi. C'est à peu près, on me dit à cette époque-là, c'était tellement le, les, les règles d'Aristote que emmener Picasso dans un théâtre, c'était comme si j'avais emmené Monsieur Renan dans les coulisses d'un music hall. Parad tells the story of a small traveling theater group in a Paris street presenting a parade a little preview to lure the passers-by into attending their show. The managers try to convince the crowd to come see the show. The performers include a Chinese magician, a little American girl, 
and two acrobats. Picasso did a wonderful drop curtain that was very much in Picasso's new neoclassical mode. Parade was a kind of mixture of extraordinary cubist sculptures. Cocteau wanted simply to prove that modernism could be construed in some way as nationalist, as patriotic. Unfortunately, in Parade, he chose composer, a composer and a collaborator who had very different ideas. Cocteau was rather conservative at this point, except artistically, but he chose Picasso, who was a foreign non-combatant, who was not nationalistic in any sense, and Satie, who was a socialist and became a communist. And what happened is that very soon on, uh, Satie and Picasso realized they had much more in common in what they wanted to do with each other than they did with Cocteau. Jean Cocteau wrote to a friend involved in the production. Make dear Satie understand that I do, after all, have some part in Parade, and that he's not alone with Picasso. He hurts my feelings when he jumps up and down and shouts to Picasso, it's you I follow, you're my master. Cocteau, of course, was quite distressed at all of this because it was no time in 1917 to have a ballet that made fun of wartime propaganda. There had been terrible losses on the Western Front, and this particular uh, performance was to be for the benefit of those soldiers who had been killed or wounded in the Eastern Ardennes recently. Apollinaire was in the audience opening night, having written the program notes for Parade. The poet was dressed in his army uniform, wearing his military decorations. He had been seriously wounded in battle, and his head was bandaged. Ce pansement nous a beaucoup servi parce que quand nous avons donné Parade, qui a été un très grand scandale, les femmes voulaient nous. À cette époque, les femmes avaient des épingles à chapeau. Elles voulaient nous crever les yeux avec leurs épingles à chapeau à Picasso, à Satie et à moi. Et Apollinaire les impressionnait à cause de son pansement, à cause de son, euh, son pansement héroïque. Et il nous a sauvés comme un, comme un véritable héros. C'est là où nous avons entendu un monsieur dire à l'autre « Si j'avais su que c'était si bête, j'aurais amené les enfants. » qui était un grand compliment pour On November 9th, 1918, two days before the day of armistice, Guillaume Apollinaire died. Weakened by his war wounds, he succumbed to the infamous Spanish flu epidemic that raged during that tragic, joyous year. The Spanish flu of 1918 was responsible for 20 million deaths throughout Europe and America. In one of his last war poems, Apollinaire wrote his own epitaph. I bequeath to the future the story of Guillaume Apollinaire, who was in the war and knew how to be everywhere. In the lucky towns in the rear, in all the rest of the universe, in those who died tangled in barbed wire, in women, in cannon, in horses, at the zenith, the nadir, the four points of the compass, and in the unique ardor of this eve of battle. I bequeath to the future the story of Guillaume Apollinaire. changed radically in the 20s and at a dizzying pace. Every contradictory thing that happened was in reaction to the war. One aspect, euphoria, the urge to celebrate being alive. There were young men like writer Joseph Cassell, just back from the war, who found a wild paradise in Montparnasse. We had won the war and we were sure it was the last. 
toute la vie s'ouvrait devant nous et une vie dont on croyait qu'elle serait admirable. Et une, un bouillonnement d'idées, d'art, de confrontation, jusqu'à 5-6 heures du matin, puis euh, les amitiés se nouaient, la bourse était commune. Et c'était vraiment, un, je vous dis, un espèce de paradis d'une violence merveilleuse. Admission to paradise was limited for the vast majority of Europeans whose experience of war's mass slaughter and human devastation was still fresh. Europe's four-year bloodbath, coupled with centuries of oppression, fueled political protest and social upheaval. In art, the most extreme form of rebellion was called Dada, Dada was a raucous movement that attacked with equal fervor the art of the past and that of its own time. Dada was a rebellious upsurge of vital energy and rage. It resulted from the absurdity, the whole immense stupidity of that imbecilic war. And our rage had to find expression somehow or another. Dada was born in a cabaret in Zurich, Switzerland. The audience was as aggressive as the performance. If the artist says it is a work of art, it is a work of art. Any work of art that can be understood is journalism. Art is dead. Art is dead. Art is dead. The name Dada was found by opening a French dictionary at random and blindly pointing to the word Dada. The movement swiftly became international actively supported by the rebellious young French intellectuals of Paris, headed by poet André Breton. A poet from Romania, Tristan Zara, was the leader of Dada. Zara was a born promoter with the media savvy of a Hollywood publicist. He got in touch with everyone in the avant-garde all over the world. The program of Dada was, contrary to what we think, communément à la destruction, c'était de créer de nouvelles valeurs, renverser les valeurs existantes. Et pour cela, évidemment, pour les renverser, il fallait détruire les, les valeurs euh, ayant cours communément et plus ou moins académiques. Et on ne peut pas construire si on ne détruit pas auparavant ce qui, ce qui existe. For years, André Breton and his friends had been urging Tristan Zara to come to Paris to help them start their own version of Dada. In early 1920, Zara arrived. International Dada stars soon followed. Man Ray, Max Ernst, Francis Picabia, even Marcel Duchamp, ever aloof, returned to France. In Paris, Dada became an overnight sensation. It gave artists the right to break all the rules. The new art of cinema offered the perfect opportunity. Hans Richter's Ghosts Before Breakfast captures the absurdist essence of Dada. Dada was provocative, but it was funny. They were playing the fools, but in fact they were serious. Violence escalated at Dada performances. The public was insulted from the stage. The audience responded with tomatoes and eggs thrown at the performers. Pretty soon, André Breton decided something new was needed, something more constructive, because Dada was negative. And with his friend Soupeau, he wrote the first automatic book, Les Chants Magnétiques. And that was the beginning, the real beginning, of surrealism. The idea was you were writing, like in a state of dream. Show your unconscious. Don't you worry about the public, 
Just be relaxed and write whatever comes without thinking as fast as you can to prevent criticism. That's automatic writing. André Masson was putting some glue on his canvas. Then he would take sand, throw it on the canvas, and then the sand would stick on the glue. And then he would add painting. It's automatic. I would say that uh, surrealism is kind of um, French version of Dada. Although the founders of surrealism were literary lights, its greatest success was among painters. By opening a door to the unconscious, surrealism offered stimulating new possibilities to visual artists. Dreams, real or invented, filled their canvases with fantastic images or startling associations. Surrealism continued to be a major international movement for at least three decades, for it could accommodate styles as different as that of Salvador Dali, Giorgio de Chirico, René Magritte, Frida Kahlo, and Juan Miró. Miró was painting quite realistic and detailed paintings when, coincidentally, Henri Masson moved next door. The influence on his work is seen clearly in the change of style. The influence that the writers and the painters had on each other is remarkable. Il y avait alors donc Miro qui peignait lui un étrange tableau qui s'appelait La Ferme. Pendant deux ans, Miro a peint ce tableau. Et je me souviens qu'on nous amusions d'ailleurs très gentiment, mais enfin on s'amusait un peu de ce peintre. C'était d'une très 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 méticuleux. En fait, il n'y a pas eu tellement d'évolution, mais passage rapide de la ferme à autre chose. Ah oui, un passage très rapide, oui, très, très rapide. À ce moment-là, je commençais à fréquenter les poètes, alors j'ai senti que, que j'avais les besoins de dépasser la peinture, et de me rapprocher de la poésie. J'ai fréquenté beaucoup plus les, les poètes que les peintres. Et c'était la poésie qui m'intéressait par-dessus tout, après avoir subi une, une discipline plastique très sévère. Ah, mon voisin était André Masson. C'est là où je connais Masson et c'est par lui que je connais tous les poètes. On vivait très fraternement en pleine misère à cette époque-là. Et la ferme a disparu. Et puis, ça a été tout le commencement de cette carrière de peintre, que je trouve ma carrière éblouissante, de Miro. Both Surrealism and Dada laid claim in vain to the allegiance of Marcel Duchamp. He remained a movement unto himself. Duchamp is credited or blamed for the rallying cry that subverted Western art. If the artist says it is a work of art, it is a work of art. He was easily bored. Only an intellectual challenge could sustain his attention for long. As a young man in Paris, Duchamp painted in the Fauvist style. And then he painted in the Cuba style. And he worked his way through the entire history of modern art and, and arrived at a point where he, he sort of came out the other side. Duchamp had a close friendship with Francis Picabia and Man Ray based on their mutual passion for art as idea. Picabia, Duchamp, Man Ray ont été les trois artistes, à mon sens, qui ont infléchi l'art moderne dans le sens de l'intellectualisation. C'est dit. Eh bien, voilà. Je pense qu'ils se sont peu souciés, à l'encontre de ce qui était courant à l'époque, de l'aspect rétinien, de l'aspect visuel de la peinture, de ce qu'on appelle le métier, la patte. Ils se sont intéressés à peindre des idées, si vous voulez, Par conséquent, la peinture n'était plus qu'accessoire. Il pouvait utiliser n'importe quel truchement 
euh, des collages, des objets, des assemblages divers. Qu'est-ce qu'un tableau ordinaire C'est un choix de couleurs, de formes qui sont décidés et après ce choix, on signe. Et le choix est le même si on, si on ne fait rien sur la toile et qu'on ait simplement choisi un objet, le choix est l'action la, la, principale. He made what came later to be called his ready-mades. The first one, even before he thought of the name, was a bicycle wheel that he mounted upside down on a kitchen stool. And he said he didn't think he was making art. He thought he was just making something pleasant to have in the studio. You could turn it with your hand, caught the light, sparked. But out of this came the idea of the ready-made. The curious thing here is that Duchamp never really said these were works of art. And since then, I mean, generations of artists and critics have pointed to the ready-made as a great turning point in Western art. If a common manufactured object can be viewed as a work of art purely because the artist has chosen it, then what does that do to the definition of art? How do you define art? Uh, people used to think they knew. After Duchamp, nobody's sure. After 1960, with the advent of pop art and conceptual moves in the 1970s, if we had to talk about a historic modern art figure who is of the greatest influence on contemporary art, it is without question Marcel Duchamp. In the very early years of the 20s, the international avant-garde was joined for the first time by a sizable group of Americans. They were a literary lot, young writers who had fought in the war. They had spent exciting furloughs in Paris and had fallen in love with the city. Paris would nurture, stimulate and transform them. We were hearing the music of Stravinsky, looking at the paintings of Picasso and Juan Gris, standing in line for opening nights of Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. James Joyce's Ulysses had just been printed. Performances like Sacre du Printemps were giving us a fresh notion of what might go on the stage. What they came back to when they came back to the States was something that was a society that was very repressive, censorious, trying to uh, stop publications. They were restricted in a lot of ways, socially and culturally. We returned home full of idealistic visions of the new world that we had fought to make free for democracy, only to find ourselves exiles in our own land. They went back to their own hometowns, their small towns, and found them to be very small townish. There was something very different that they had seen, especially in Paris, and they wanted it very much, and they made their uh, return trip as soon as possible. that the Americans were so delighted to be in Paris is because they fled a prohibition era in America where they could not drink alcohol unless they did it furtively in a speakeasy. Whereas in Europe, in France, alcohol was a part of everyday life. This is where you could get published, you could get exhibited, whereas you couldn't in America. They also found their audience here. If they couldn't get published, they couldn't get read. And the people that wanted to read the avant-garde works, people that wanted to see the avant-garde paintings, were here in Paris. 
and there was the incredible cheapness of living, so they could do things without having to hold jobs down. For a dollar, you could almost live for a week. It's hard to talk about the appeal of Paris without talking about the idea of place. We absorb places into our lives, into our identities. We dream about places. They become part of our unconscious. And I think Paris offered a kind of rich plenitude, particularly to Americans, because it was so different from any place in the United States. It was strange, it was beautiful, it was elegant. It was a place that opened them up to their own identities that had been repressed in the United States. In Paris, they were free to invent themselves, to become someone else altogether. They were sojourners. They were people who were having an adventure, but it was a, an adventure that would change their lives forever, that would give them a way to look at the world, uh, to find themselves as artists, to be among artists. As Malcolm Cowley said about it, we traveled 3,000 miles back to a place we had once been at wartime in order to find America, the America that we wanted to write about. Ernest Hemingway was one who found the America he wanted to write about in Paris. In 1921, Hemingway, newly married at age 22, arrived in Paris with his wife Hadley. He carried letters of introduction from writer Sherwood Anderson to Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein, leading figures in modern Parisian literary circles. These letters described Hemingway as instinctively in touch with everything worthwhile. He made the decision in 1917 that he was going to defy his parents. He wasn't going to go to college. He was going to become a reporter, and then he was going to see the world. Well, he made up for it in Paris. He plunged himself into an intensive program of reading at the bookstore run by Sylvia Beach. Read the Russian masters. He read Stendhal, Flaubert, Ezra Pound and Gertrude Stein were his principal teachers. Ezra Pound urged Hemingway to avoid adjectives. Gertrude Stein told him, start all over and concentrate. Remarks are not literature. Both critiqued his stories. Ezra was sometimes right. Gertrude was always right. Although Hemingway's Parisian mentors urged him to get away from journalism. Hemingway learned a great deal from his work in the field as a journalist. As a foreign correspondent, he was obliged to cable back stories uh, to Canada. And in order to save money, he would eliminate phrases that could readily be inferred by the reader at the other end of the wire. In that process, Hemingway learned something about the power of omission, discovering that less is more. Ernest Hemingway loved Paris, but after The Sun Also Rises, his first novel, and Until a Movable Feast, his last book, he never published anything about the Paris he loved. Except once, in The Snows of Kilimanjaro, Hemingway speaks to us through its central character, the writer Harry. And in that poverty, and in that quarter across the street from a boucherie chevaline, and a wine cooperative, he had written the start of all he was to do. There never was another part of Paris that he loved like that. The sprawling trees, the old white plaster houses painted brown below, the long green of the auto bus in that round square, the purple flower dye upon the paving, the sudden drop down the hill of the Rue Cardinal Le Moine to the river, and the other way, the narrow, crowded world of the Rue Mouffetar. No, no, he had never written about Paris. Not the Paris he cared about.
In the warm climate of their early friendship, Gertrude and Alice were godmothers to Hemingway's son, Bumby, and Hemingway was a fervent missionary for the cause of Stein's publication. It wasn't easy for her to get published because what she was writing was not in any way at all mainstream. It was Hemingway who was very instrumental in getting The Making of Americans published, and I think that uh, she was thrilled by that. The friendship lasted until about 1925, when Hemingway wanted Stein to write a favorable review of his new collection of stories, In Our Time, but Gertrude Stein refused. From that point on, there was great hostility. By the time she wrote the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, she was saying things about Hemingway, that um, he was uh, a rabbit, that he was fearful, that if he only told the real story about himself, then he would be a real writer. Now, how is he going to respond to that? She never could write dialogue. She learned it from me. When a writer writes about nothing but sex and death, you can be sure he is impotent as a man and as a writer as well. Salon woman. What a lousy, stinking life. A rose is a rose is an onion. Gertrude Stein, pioneer woman expatriate, had settled in Montparnasse in 1903. But the dazzling group of creative women drawn to Paris in the 20s chose Saint-Germain-du-Pré, a colorful historic quarter that runs down to the Seine. They shared certain motivations in deciding to come to Paris. American women were expected to marry young, have children, and take care of the home, period. Paris offered the freedom to break with convention, to live independently on their own. Most of these women had no children. Some were lesbians. Talents ignored or suppressed in the United States flourished in the supportive climate of the small, intimate Saint-Germain-du-Pré community. Paris enabled the women of the left bank, as they are often called, to make original contributions to modernism. Writer Juna Barnes could see her groundbreaking novel, Nightwood, published to rare praise from T.S. Eliot. Romaine Brooks could exhibit her strange autobiographical paintings. Berenice Abbott photographed the souls of her sitters. Janet Flanner had her finger on the pulse of the literary and artistic life in France. For 44 years in her letter from Paris for The New Yorker, under the pen name Jeannet, she commented on the great names and the great times with a pen as sharp as her eye. There was a constant in and out all of the time, particularly where Janet Flanner lived. Um, there were stories of Fitzgerald coming in uh, late at night and banging on the door and being very drunk, or Hemingway, who often visited Flanner so much that he had a special chair at their place, and they always called it Hemingway's chair. The rendezvous for these expatriates, both men and women, was Shakespeare and Company, one of the few English-language bookstores on the left bank. The magnet was its owner, Sylvia Beach. Shakespeare and Company was where writers would find each other. Sylvia Beach would sometimes collect their mail. She would lend them money. She would introduce them to publishers. If a group founded a small magazine, she would sell it there. Sylvia carried pollen like a bee. She cross-fertilized those writers. It was not merely for the pleasure of friendship that Joyce, Eliot, Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald, and so many others took the path to Shakespeare and Company. I know for my part what I owe to Scott Fitzgerald, but what so many other writers owe to each other is Sylvia's secret. When Sylvia Beach 
came to Paris, she noticed how many of the avant-garde poets were published by a bookstore, and so she thought she would find this place. So on a cold, windy March day, she was blown into this small bookshop on the left bank, and she met Adrienne Monnier. And it was friendship and then love at first sight. I came over to Paris during the war to study French literature. And uh, there I used to see the French and I got to know all the French writers. And then I decided to have a bookshop of my own and it was my French friend who encouraged me to, and my French friend. And they all said, oh yes, have this bookshop and we'll all come to it. And uh, I knew Hemingway very well and uh, he just rambled into the shop one day and, uh, and he showed me his scars right there in my bookshop before everybody and took off his shoe and his sock and showed his scars. And uh, he was uh, very attractive, very appealing indeed. Sylvia Beach sold only literature published in English, Adrien Monnier in French. And they went on to create the nexus, really, for the interchange of French and American and English literature. I met Joyce at the house of a poet, and I thought him a fascinating man. When I told him about my bookshop, it seemed to amuse him very much. And Joyce came to see me the next day. He walked into the shop, and soon we began to talk about Ulysses, for that was uppermost in my mind. Finally, he came one day to show me this little review, and he said, you see, this is now being completely suppressed, and my book, as he pronounced it, will never come out. So he sat there with his head in his hands, and uh, I uh, said to him, would you like me to publish Ulysses? And he said, I would. <laughs> he was very, seemed very much relieved, in fact. Why, I don't know, because it wouldn't inspire confidence in anyone who had such a book that he'd taken seven years to write, to give it to the, into the hands of someone so inexperienced and young and uh, just a kind of a little bookshop, not a publishing house at all. From that moment on, James Joyce and Ulysses became the cause to which Sylvia Beach's life would be devoted for years. Beach found that she was expected to have the huge, illegible manuscript typed and to pay the tremendous printing costs of the lengthy work. The costs rose astronomically when Joyce scribbled some 90,000 words more on the already typeset proofs, one-third more. Adrienne Monnier could only stand by helplessly as Beach insisted that Joyce be free to do as he wished, regardless of cost. When Ulysses was published in 1922, it hit the English and American literary world like a bombshell from which it would never recover. With its radical invention of language and sexual frankness, Joyce's modern masterpiece slammed the door on the 19th century. This is Janet Flanner's description of the author. Joyce was a slender marble monument to himself. Jazz became a real symbol of change in France in the 1920s. It symbolized a kind of exposure to a broader world. It also symbolized a kind of loosening of French society. There was a small group of French people that uh, saw themselves as much more avant-garde and embraced new styles of music, new styles of dance, new styles of behavior. And for them, jazz was the symbol of the future. The effect of jazz on the Paris art scene between 1919 and 1929 is hard to exaggerate. Jazz symbolized modernity, and the performer Josephine Baker embodied jazz. 
She was a favorite subject of the avant-garde. Josephine Baker became a star almost overnight. La Revue Negra opened in the mid-1920s as the culmination of several years of fascination with African art as well as with um, African-American jazz. One could say that the table was set and then she arrived. Josephine Baker was an extraordinary dancer. She was also a great comic. Josephine Baker swiftly became the most celebrated performer in France. Adored by the public, the darling of French society. She developed in Paris. She really does make herself into a French music hall star. Josephine Baker, de retour d'une longue tournée en Amérique, est accueillie par ses amis parisiens. The French allowed her to become an entertainer who was not simply a comic. Among the many African-American artists attracted by stories of the charms of Paris and its colorblind attitudes was a young poet who would find a new voice in the city on the Seine. Langston Hughes had a very interesting sojourn in Paris. He decided in the mid-1920s that he wanted to travel around and see the world. So in 1924, he worked his way across the Atlantic on a steamer. My train ticket and the French visa had taken nearly all my money. I got to the Gare du Nord with only seven dollars in my pocket. I didn't know anybody in Paris. I met some musicians at a Montmartre cafe. I told them, I've just come to Paris and I'm just looking for any kind of job there is. One of the men says, there ain't no any kind of job here. Unless you can play jazz or tap dance, you just as well go back home. So what Langston Hughes did was he found his way to a jazz club, Le Grand Duc, um, in Montmartre, and got work there as a busboy. Found himself really at ground zero of the, the jazz scene in Paris, pretty much by accident. He really began to incorporate jazz uh, rhythms, jazz sounds into his own writing. And I think that this is something that he really learns in Paris. Play that thing, jazz band. Play it for the lords and ladies, for the dukes and counts, for the whores and gigolos, for the American millionaires and the school teachers out for a spree. Play it, jazz band. You know that tune that laughs and cries at the same time? You know it. There'd be a jam session until 7 or 8 in the morning. Music that would make your heart stand still. At dawn in a Paris nightclub in the Rue Pigalle, and the one high window letting the soft dawn in. The sounds of jazz vibrated in the concert halls of Paris, as well as its music halls. Modern composers like Stravinsky and Satie had absorbed jazz into their music in works that strongly influenced the young post-war generation of French composers. Most of them loved jazz, which they believed to be music of their own experience, music that was real, uh, music to which they could relate. Darius Mio, I think, was the most effective in bringing together uh, traditional classical craftsmanship with uh, a, a modern, uh, you might say, popular vernacular languages. Not only uh, did he start to explore jazz in France, he made a tour, a concert tour of the United States, and he went to Harlem, and he sat in the jazz clubs and tried to notate the jazz himself. Jazz for him was a way of bringing together different groups, different races. 
Mio does this beautifully in La Création du Monde, with a scenario by Sandra, a setting by Léger, in which he tells the story of uh, an African creation myth using jazz. Mio was a leading figure in a group christened Les Six, the Six, young French composers who became a significant force in post-war French music, and a major reason that Paris continued to be a center for modern music during the luminous years. Twice their age, Eric Satie was the eccentric mentor of this group. Although the six were all very different, they were united in sharing Sati's goal, to create everyday music for everyday people, a music stripped of grandiose pretensions. Sati's kind of a mingling of a kind of ironic classicism with elements from popular art was to capture the imagination of the next generation of composers, the generation of Les Six, many of whom were present at the premiere of Parade in 1917, just as they had been present, uh, certainly, um, at the Rite of Spring. And these were their great models. Other members of the group, of course, included Louis Duré, Francis Poulenc, Germaine Taillefer, Arthur Oneger, Georges Auric, and Cocteau became their spokesman. They were all seeking a music that reflected their own experience, a music that reflected technology, the modern world, popular experience, even if it was articulated through traditional forms. I had the good fortune to be in my 20s during the 20s. In fact, I had what might be called a front row seat on the whole spectacle of that lively decade. In music, the decade 20 to 30 was especially important because those years played a key role in the direction 20th century music was to take. It seems to me that many of our present day preoccupations in composition can be found there. I arrived fresh out of Brooklyn, aged 20 and all agog at the prospect of studying composition in the country that had produced Debussy and Ravel. Anyone who had serious pretensions as a composer had to go to Paris to finish his studies. The French decided to establish a summer school with French teachers for American students. The American Conservatory of Music in the Palace of Fontainebleau. Aaron Copeland and Virgil Thompson were the first Americans to study there with Nadia Boulanger. Boulanger has been called the best music teacher in the world. The names of students that came from the United States to study with her form a who's who in American music. Nadia Boulanger wished to promote the avant-garde at a time in which it was very difficult to do so. Boulanger played a very important role in bringing uh, not only traditional French compositional techniques, but knowledge of the avant-garde to the Americans in that period. Her studio was not just a place where we studied with her. It was a kind of musical center of Paris. She had her Wednesday afternoon classes for her students, and after the class was over, all the musical greats of Paris came for tea. I met Stravinsky there, and I met Poulenc, and Mio, all the younger composers. I even shook hands with Saint-Saëns in that place. While absorbing the radical musical notions that Paris offered during his three years there, 1921 to 1924, Aaron Copeland began his search for a uniquely American sound. It was Igor Stravinsky's bold integration of Russian folk themes into his modern works for the Ballet Russe that inspired Copland's innovative use of American folk tunes in his own music. Jazz was American folk music, 
Copeland composed groundbreaking jazz works while still in Paris. Back in America, he combined folk tunes with Paris avant-garde motifs, creating the distinctive American sound for which he is celebrated. August 19, 1929. With the death in Venice of Serge Diaghilev, the Ballet Russe, which had lit up the West since 1909, went dark. The 20s, Diaghilev's life, and the Ballet Russe would close in the same year. Stravinsky brought flowers every year to Diaghilev's grave. October 29, 1929. The shock waves of the Wall Street crash struck the European continent, depressing its economy, decimating the international avant-garde in Paris, and sending home most, but not all, of its expatriate artists. Paris was vibrant for much of the 30s. Picasso's variety of styles continued to astonish. Brock and Picasso eventually reconciled, but besides resenting Picasso's joking referral to him as my ex-wife, Brock knew his survival as an artist depended on breaking with his former collaborator. It would be Matisse who would become important to Picasso. Their rivalry emerged as a challenging stimulant to the creativity of both painters. The international group of artists in Paris who joyously dared to speak for their time made luminous the first three decades of the 20th century. Years when a blueprint for our future was imagined. Years that witnessed the making of the modern. years is available on DVD for $24.99 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. <laughs>